As has been said before, it's been found that it's the Sufis that are the masters of the allegory, bringing together the sacred symbols and archetypes and numbers to tell our spiritual journey. Our challenge with the story to be told is not to try to understand the story as it's being told, but to be in the story until the end. And this is true of our own life's experiences. Not to try to understand the story whilst it's being lived, but to stay in the story until it's done. This is a story of a great king who had three sons, princes, strapping, handsome, strong fellows. But above even the love of his sons, the king loved his garden. In his garden there were flowers of all descriptions, exotic, smelling, wonderful, wonderful blooms. He adored his garden. Every day, after taking care of his kingdom, he would go to the garden to rest, taking in its aromas, admiring the blooms. But one day, when he was walking in his garden, he noticed that one of his most beautiful flowers had been taken. And again, the next evening, another bloom was gone. So he set the task to his sons to find out who or what it was that was stealing his flowers. So first of all, it was the eldest son who was given the task. So that evening he had a tent put up with some blankets and cushions and he put his sword by his side. But as soon as night fell, sleep came over him and a herd of elephants could have come through and he would not have heard them so deep was his sleep. And again the next morning another flower was gone. So the next night it was the task of the second son to keep vigil, but he too fell asleep and another flower was taken. So the third night it was the task of the third prince, and this time the prince, laying his sword by his side, but before doing so, slashing his arm and rubbing salt in the wound, so that each time he went to sleep, the pain of the salt would wake him up. So as he was keeping his vigil, sure enough, in the middle of the night, there was a crashing sound, and he saw a beast with great luminous eyes approaching the garden to take the flower. Now the prince lunged at the beast and wounded it and it ran away. So the next morning, the <coughs> prince was able to follow the trail of 
blood which led him to a well, a well that had run dry. So pinpointing this well, he went to tell his father and his brothers, and both his brothers said, let me go, I will go and finish off the beast. So they went to the well, and the first brother was lowered down, but he had not gone too far when all of a sudden he saw something bright and so afraid was he, he called out, pull me up, pull me up now. Then the second prince was lowered down, but his scabbard of his sword caught on the side of the well and frightened him with the sound, so he too called out, bring me up. So the third prince said, when I call out to you, just know that it is so that you can lower more rope down to me. So the third prince was lowered into the well until he came to the bottom, completely dry as it was. But as his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, he noticed that there was a passageway. So he followed this passage to the end, and there in his sights was a palace. And so he entered that palace, but not before he heard a great <coughs> thundering sound. But when he entered the palace, there in front of him sat a beautiful maiden, a maiden so luminous that his eyes were almost blinded. But in her lap rested the giant head of the beast. But the beautiful maiden pointed to the beast's sword which lay nearby, not daring to speak, but indicating that the prince should dispose of the beast. And so before taking up the sword, being the noble being that he was, he woke the beast so that there would be an equal battle if there was to be one. But as the beast awoke, the prince took the beast's sword and locked its head from its shoulders. The maiden then told her story and begged the prince, please save me, let me go back to my family where I belong. But sadly, in the great ruction that had taken place, the rocks from the side of the well had fallen, barring the escape of the prince and the maiden. The prince looked around. What was he to do? How could they escape? When suddenly there appeared an old man, a typical old man of this kind, his long white beard flowing. 
So the prince asked, how can we escape? And the old man said, when the black ram and the white ram meet, then whoever is greater will take you to where it is that you wish to go. Just then, the prince noticed indeed that there was a white ram and a black ram at loggerheads bashing each other's head. Now it's not known whether it was the white ram or the black ram who was the winner of this battle. But the prince was able to put the maiden on the back of the white ram and the white ram immediately ascended and took the maiden to the top of the well where the two princes of the realm were waiting and both smitten with her beauty they took her back to their palace to present her to the king with the thought that one of them would marry her. When the king asked where was his other son, they said, oh no, he was lost in the well. But the father, the king, went into mourning and said, no wedding will take place for one year. Now, down the well in that area where the beast's palace was, the prince was contemplating his fate. But there was the black ram. So there was nothing else for him to do but to alight on that animal. But that animal, instead of taking him above to the earth's surface, took him below, so that one after the others, he descended through the seven levels of the earth or existence and there he found himself in what felt for him like an abyss but in that abyss suddenly he heard sounds the sounds of screeching and when his eyes became accustomed to the gloom, he found himself on a ledge beside another ledge on which there was a nest of seven fledgling griffins, those great magnificent birds. But as he looked, there was a huge serpent approaching the nest to devour the fledglings. Immediately, the prince took his sword and sliced off the head of the great snake, sliced it into pieces to feed the fledgling and hungry birds. Now when the great mother griffin came back to her nest, 
she saw this human appearing to threaten her fledgling birds and she was about to bring down a great rock on the prince's head when the seven little birds flapped their wings and protected the prince from their mother's wrath. And then the great bird saw the remains of the snake and immediately knew what had happened. She was so grateful to the prince. She asked, what can I do for you? And he said, I wish to return from whence I came. And the great bird said, I owe this to you. I will do so. But to traverse these dimensions of earth, I need food for each level. So the prince killed seven sheep and placed them on the back of the great bird who lifted herself up with the prince on her back and one by one at each level consuming another sheep. They came to the last level and the great bird said, My strength is flagging. But sadly, the last sheep that the prince had held to be fed to the great bird fell. So there was no food to give the great bird enough strength to pass through this last realm. So the prince took his sword and cut off his right leg. The bird, using the last of her strength, passed through the last dimension to bring the prince back to where he belonged. The great bird, before departing, breathed on the prince and without needing to say a word, the prince found himself whole and complete once again. When he returned to the palace and the rejoicing of the king, indeed, of course, we know the end of the story, he married the maiden his two brothers conceding to him not only the bride but the kingdom itself. If indeed we try to analyze this story to understand its levels, the symbols and archetypes and divine numerology, our mind would be scrambled. But like all the stories of life, the experiences of our life that have their beginning their middle and their end. Understanding comes after the story is done.
Where are your stories now? Do you have any unfinished stories? And if so, are you trying futilely, desperately to understand their meaning? Futilely. This challenges us. Like this story, convoluted, multidimensional as it was, its symbols, its archetypes, and its sacred numerology known by us at deep levels. But it's only when we take the story as a whole, letting all of those parts of ourselves that have the knowledge, the awareness of the sacred symbols, archetypes and numbers. to bring about an understanding. Have you any unfinished stories? And if so, what does this story tell you? <laughs>